Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Islam. Since the beginning of Islam 1400 years ago, mutual distrust and rivalry between Islam and the West has perpetuated the view that Islam will always be an opposing force to whatever the West stands for. Especially now that Marxism has been laid to rest, many people in the West perceive Islam as the next major threat to Western civilization. Ordered by Lebanese soldiers to leave their makeshift tent camp, the 415 Palestinians deported by Israel into southern Lebanon tried to march back into occupied Palestine, their homeland, only to have Israel's client militia fire mortar and machine gun rounds at them. Just as the state of Israel was the first to recognize the Iraqi nuclear danger, thus we stand first today in the line of fire against the danger of extremist Islam. These, ironically, are the words of Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, a country which came into existence only because of religion and which has unleashed on the local population, the Palestinians, the most militant kind of controls and suppression that history has known. The Iranian Revolution is touted by the media as a major landmark in this evolving process of Islamic fundamentalism. In fact, Iran recently has been increasingly blamed for breeding and exporting Islamic fundamentalists and fundamentalism. Interestingly, the terminology used by the media to describe the unrest in various Muslim countries seems also to be hardening. Now it is more common to see the terms Islamic extremism, Islamic radicalism, Islamic militancy, and even Islamic terrorism in common usage. The romance with the freedom fighters or Mujahideen of Afghanistan is now over. They are now Islamic militants. The glorious pursuit by the West of fostering democratic forms of government all over the world suddenly comes to an end when it comes to Muslim countries. The overwhelming election victory of the Islamic Front in Algeria is set aside in favor of a military junta because of the perceived danger of empowering a Muslim fundamentalist government. And leader after leader of the Fis Party were indeed promising nothing short, nothing short of a return to a, the single party system and to arbitrary rule. In a sense, the Fis leadership promised to abolish the constitution and the multi-party system under the motto of no charter, no constitution. To suspend individual freedom and particularly freedom of the, of the press. To impose their concept of Islamic law. And when the government does emerge by the will of the people and bases itself on the Sharia or the Islamic law, as in Sudan, it is dealt with as an outcast nation, unworthy of any help from the West or even from other Muslim governments. It's quite true that the Sudan has become uh, topical recently in the media. Uh, these developments have been taking their course for quite a while in the Sudan. And uh, just now they have erupted on the public scene. And uh, any attempt to personalize uh, these developments, I think, is, uh, is erroneous. These are fundamental changes which have been taking their, their course for quite a while. So you think that uh, these things were bound to happen and uh, the, the dynamics were, were sort of driving in that direction anyhow? And, uh, yes, it's a, a typical progress of the Islamic movement to begin uh, as an intellectual current and then it takes the aspect of a social movement, then it develops a political dimension, mm -hmm. and ultimately when it becomes an established... Mass a mass movement it becomes an established state and then it's already on the on the world scene and uh... since the assassination of president sadat president husni mubarak's government has been increasingly engaged in fighting the so-called fundamentalists interestingly another situation is developing in saudi arabia a country which displays the basic and fundamental islamic creed on its flag that there is no god but god and muhammad is his messenger According to the headlines of a report in the LA Times, 
The rise of Islamic radicalism has set the stage for the showdown with liberals in a challenge to the ruling family. The term fundamentalism, according to Webster's Dictionary, means religious beliefs based on a literal interpretation of everything in the Bible and regarded as fundamental to Christian faith and morals. Also, it refers to the 20th century movement among some American Protestants based on these beliefs. We all have to understand that a great historic religion, whether it be Islam or Christianity, is not a single uh, monolithic unity in which millions of people all think exactly the same Indeed. and all have the same political views and all have the same um, aesthetic views and views about everything and that it's on the contrary each of these great faiths is a tradition of faith. It, uh, they have uh, diversified over the centuries. There are vast differences between different Christians in different centuries, different countries, different levels of culture, and exactly the same, I'm sure, in the case of Islam. So that one should never, um, one should never confuse, for example, Islam with the particular policy of a particular government of an Islamic country at a particular moment, nor should one confuse Christianity with the policy of a particular government at a particular moment. Uh, it's much more complicated. Well, that is tied in with total dissatisfaction with the value system of your society. And when it's a, a society that is not a very productive one, it's a poor society, and it is turned into a consumer society where nobody can afford it except a very, very small exploitative elite, then there is a rejection of the value system of the government. And when you reject the value system, you look around for a new one. And if you say that the government has become capitalist, so I reject capitalism, then some people might look at communism. And then they reject that too, because it's an alienism. So you look inside yourself. You look into your own roots. And when you look into your own roots, you are left with Islam. And when you can't find any way to turn to, then you turn to God. So the fundamentalists are people who want to do something to get out of the hopelessness of alienation. They can't find it in any political ism around. They turn to religion, to the fundamentals of religion, to try and understand what they can do to reform themselves and their society. The quest is in terms of finding a better society, of building a better world, of doing away with the corruption, of doing away with the advantages that some groups gain at the expense of others, of trying to build a, a more egalitarian, a better society. There is almost a, a millenarian or even a utopian idea behind it that if only your society could go back to its religious teachings and reacquire its value system, that it could be strong, could be powerful. There's a lot of truth in that, but at the same time, that's too easy. There's a lot more behind the corruption and the uh, decadence of a society than simply uh, going back to the roots of religion. You can use that as a foundation, which is what fundamentalists are doing. But it's an uphill struggle from then on. The majority of the people in the United States are Christian. And one may ask how fundamentalism is important to the nation. Notwithstanding the utterances of the likes of Governor Fortas of Mississippi that America is a Christian nation, or Pat Robertson's presidential bid to Christianize the nation, or the pronouncements of the right wing of the Republican Party during the Reagan-Bush era, America remains a nation based on the principle of separation of church and state. Therefore, it is inconceivable that any fundamentalist group may take over the reins of government and steer the country to its own faith or values for its own purposes. Thus, at the state level, the impact of fundamentalism on state policies seems insignificant. During the Reagan years, in the Bible Belt of this country, in the South, including Texas, the fundamentalists, like Falwell and other televangelists, have had their day in the sun. Their impact now seems to be fading. In Islam, there is no separation of church and state, since God is the ultimate sovereign. 
Islamic Sharia, which is poorly understood by the West, is the basis of the Islamic State. Well, I think that clearly the Sharia developed as, uh, f for two reasons. One, it was the natural concern of Muslims. If, in fact, the Quran told Muslims that you are to be the best of communities, you ought to promote good and forbid evil. Um, you ought to realize God's will in history. Then the concern of the Muslim, and on the basis of that, you will be rewarded or punished. The natural concern of any human being in that situation would be, well, then I need to know what the good is and what evil is. I need to know what the straight path is that I am to pursue. And so that concern, I think, motivated Muslims looking to the Quran and to the example of the Prophet. As the Prophet died and, and the early followers di disappeared and the community spread and his new situations were faced, then it became more and more important for Muslims in complex situations with new issues and questions to answer those questions, to find Muslim answers. That was one. The other reason the Sharia developed was that groups of pious Muslims began to notice that some of the early caliphs were doing simply what they wanted. And what they wanted to do, these early uh, scholars, was to define what Islam was and the Islamic way of life so that it would provide a kind of hedge, kind of set some limits on a ruler so that the ruler couldn't simply uh, engage in creative fabrication. Uh, what we then see in the early community is the development of Islamic law, its distinctiveness as a kind of comprehensive blueprint for society, and its application, but what we also see is that rulers devised ways of developing their own, they might call them ordinances, but their own sort of parallel systems of regulations and courts. So you had the Sharia and the Qadi courts, but you also had the Mazalam uh, courts and the Nizam or a variety of terms that were used. And so down through history, you had the ideal of the Sharia, and you had, at the same time also, the rulers' regulations, both guiding the community. Yet, however the ruler might wish to act, whether the ruler was uh, a, a pious Muslim or somebody who was not all that pious, the ruler always knew that his legitimacy was based not only on the strength of his military, but the fact that he had to acknowledge that the Sharia or God's law was to be the ideal for the community, and that was there, um, you know, throughout the history of Islam.